do? Please, are these people stupid? There is always some excuse. There is a lot of women making a lot of money in the sex industry. Can't be all slaves. While preparing this conference, I found on the internet this kind of comments to media news related to the use of voodoo in Nigerian sex trafficking networks. As we see, there is not a clear understanding of how African traditional religion is used by criminal networks to enslave girls and women and force them to be sexually exploited. This lack of information or misunderstanding on how African traditional religion is used is also shared by people who should be more informed about sex trafficking network, such as journalists, law enforcement actors or experts that work with victims. As an example, in courts, tribunals state that sex trafficking victims believe in voodoo because they have a low level of education or because they have some psychological troubles. Media usually inform that Nigerian girls are being captured by voodoo rituals to be sexually exploited. So, in our imagination, we make fun of victims just like walking like zombies inside the circle of sexual exploitation, just because they are called by some voodoo rituals. But, does voodoo really work like that in Nigerian sex trafficking networks? So, what is the role of African traditional religion in Nigerian sex trafficking networks? What are the legal consequences, if any, of this abuse or misuse of traditional beliefs? And how to go with victims that have gone through this kind of rituals are the three main points that are going to be developed in this global conference. My name is Anna Dolls, and for more than six years I have been researching on crimes linked to the belief and practices of African witchcraft and voodoo, both in Africa and in Europe. When I speak about my research, people usually stop me and it's like, yeah, yeah, really interesting. And then they ask the question. So, do witchcraft and voodoo really exist? And my answer is always the same. I don't know. Sure, <laughs> I would really would love to have the answer. But when talking about voodoo and sex trafficking, what it really matters is that voodoo is true for the people who believe in it. And that is the starting point to analyze the role of African traditional beliefs in Nigerian sex trafficking. Nigerian networks control the trafficking of girls and young women for sexual purposes from Africa to Europe. These networks are known for being quite flexible and built up from small structures that have a wide net. Compared to other criminal gangs, Nigerian victims have to pay a huge amount of debt. Women play also a significant role as traffickers. And traffickers have included African traditional beliefs in their modus operandi of sexual trafficking of girls and young women. How many children are being trafficked from Nigeria to Europe to be sexually exploited? There is no clear data about that. What is clear is that sex trafficking is a reality, the number of African girls and young women trafficked is increasing, and the impact that this experience has been victim, and especially in children, is huge. So let's start now with the first part, which is the role of African traditional beliefs in Nigerian sex trafficking. We're getting closer to this topic, two main problems are faced. The first one is that there is a veil of secrecy and mystery around voodoo issues, and especially when they are related to criminal activities as sex trafficking. The second is that the Terminology concepts related to African traditional beliefs are quite reduced in European languages as English, French or Spanish, compared to the vocabulary related to these issues in African languages. They have more vocabulary to design different phenomena related to their traditional beliefs. But when talking about Nigerian sex trafficking, it's important 
cliffs to make different between voodoo as an African traditional belief and ritual oaths as an element of this faith. As you may know, traffickers usually take profit of the will of some Nigerian girls to migrate from Africa to Europe. So once the girls who want to move to Europe and traffickers arrange the travel from Nigeria to Europe, this pact is sent in a shrine to ritual oaths. Through these oaths, traffickers commit to pay all costs of the travel, while girls promise to repay the debt, be respectful to the traffickers and not go to the police. This oath is also reinforced by the fact that the debt can be repaid, so victims can be whether released or promoted to supervisors. Together with these ritual oaths, other rituals may also be conducted to protect girls during the travel or guarantee success for them. These ritual oaths are taken in ceremonies that are quite symbolic and theatrical. So there is not a standard ritual, but some patterns are usually followed. So girls need to be asked to remove their clothes, take baths, or eat or drink something. The person who administers the oath need to also make some incisions across the victim's body to introduce some kind of magical medication. The person who administers the oath usually take also like fingernails, blood, teeth or hair for the victim, as well as from one of her relatives, usually the mother of one of her sisters. With all these things, together with some girls' underwear or other issues such as animal blood, cola nuts, water, palm oil, a small packet is made. This package becomes a concrete sign of the agreement and are kept by the traffickers or the person who administered the oath until the death is paid. There is the belief that the person who keeps the packet will control the victim. As we said, of part of the ceremony have a symbolic meaning. So the fact of being naked reinforces the feeling of vulnerability of the victim. Colors have also a meaning, so white protects from bad spirits, while red color represents blood and death, and black the darkness that would follow as the consequence of breaking the earth. It's also becoming more and more common for the victim and her family to reinforce this ritual oath in Pentecostal churches or by the signature of a formal contract drafted by a lawyer. Once in destination country, often when victims begin to turn against their traffickers, follow-up rituals need to be conducted, as well as the use of treats and black magic. So, what are the consequences of these ritual oaths? Well, these ritual oaths link victims with the traffickers, their community, and the different gods or deities. So after taking the oath, the authority of traffickers increase. Indeed, these oaths are the basis of the relationship between traffickers and victims, a relation that may be perceived as reciprocal by victims, which is one of the main strengths of Nigerian sex trafficking networks. This ritual oath also ties victims with their community. So the oath has effects at the spiritual level but also at the social one. Victims may feel that they are betraying their families if the debt remains unpaid, for example. And this emotional weight of the family may be also stronger in minors, who may need more time to accept the idea that they can no longer support their families. The ritual oaths also links the victim with the different gods or deities. So victims really believe that terrible things may happen to them and their families if they don't pay the debt. So terrible things such as illness, death, madness. So everything that may happen to them 
including post-traumatic symptoms such as anxiety or sleep disorders, may be interpreted as being the result of breaking the pact. Besides, these ritual oaths have also an impact in three main aspects that are especially important for the identification of girls as victims and for the fight against sex trafficking networks. So, as a consequence of the oath, sometimes traffickers need to now closely monitor the victims. In fact, the fear of breaking the pact is so strong that victims follow traffickers' orders, even if they are not around. That makes it more difficult the identification of victims, because compared to other sex trafficking victims, Nayaran ones may enjoy for an apparent freedom. Nevertheless, we should not forget that physical threats and violence against Nigerian victims and their families is also a reality, as well as the confiscation of documents and money or the lack of independence. As a second consequence of these oaths, Nigerian victims are not prone to denounce their situation because of the fears of breaking the, the pact or the ritual oaths but also because of the fear of the reaction of the criminal gangs. So both the negative impact of breaking the oath and the violence that the criminal network meet put in place against victims that run away from the sex trafficking circle affect the victim and her family. So even when the victim says, OK, I, I cannot anymore, I just give up and I said wherever it means come to me. But how to accept something negative that's happened also to your family? That may be even more difficult for children who, again, may need more time to overcome their fears and denounce the sex trafficking situation as they may have a strong feeling that they are betraying their family and the traffickers. A third aspect to be taken into consideration is that Nigerian victims may not perceive themselves as victims, as they feel that because they have taken the oath, they have accepted or at least deserved the consequences or the situation of sexual exploitation. At the same time, through these oaths, the responsibility for the success of the immigration from Nigeria to Europe is left from the traffickers to the victims. So victims usually believe that they deserve the negative consequences because of their irresponsibility in breaking the ritual oath. This belief, again, makes be stronger in children. The second question is whether ritual oaths may be considered as an appropriate mean to constitute the crime, the crime of sex trafficking according to the Palermo Protocol to prevent and punish trafficking in person. As regards the question of consent, the protocol clearly states that a child victim's consent is irrelevant whether or not means have been employed by the traffic. But what happens if the victim is no more 17 years old than 364 days, but is already 18 years old? This question is really relevant because usually traffickers um, state that victims have agreed to this situation in order to get away of their crimes. As human trafficking only exists if there is no consent, or if the consent has been at some point invalidated, it's important to determine if the agreement that victims did through the ritual oaths establish consent to sex trafficking, and if so, whether this consent may be negated. For victims over 18, consent is only valid if it's freely undertaken and not the result of coercive means. It's also valid if it embodies the whole process of exploitation and not only the fact of working in prostitution, and if the consent is kept during the whole process. 
So, strictly speaking, it can be considered that ritual oaths invalidate women's cause. First, because mostly taking the oath is a condition sine qua non to travel to Europe. Victim has no choice by taking the oath. It's believed that more than 80% of Nigerian victims that are in Europe have taken the oath. Second, regarding the, the content of the agreement, victims agree to participate in the rituals without really understanding the commitment that they are taking. Victims are not fully informed of the commitment that they are taking, whether because the information provided by traffickers is fake, confusing or incomplete. And there is no possibility of revocating the oath. Without forgetting that it's not possible to consent to the NSA. A third reason is that the purpose of traffickers is to ensure that the pact is followed. So since the 90s, traffickers incorporate these ritual oaths in the circle of sexual exploitation to ensure that victims will follow their orders as they realize that it was a good tool to control victims. So we cannot consider that ritual oaths as a free consent to be sexually exploited. Anyway, even if theoretically it's possible to give consent, the definition of trafficking and the actions of the traffickers made it hypothesis quite impossible. So we may think, okay, legally ritual oaths are not valid, but sometimes African tradition goes in another way. Well, it's important to keep in mind that many witch doctors and voodoo priests are working together with police and NGO because they really believe that sex trafficking networks are making a grown use of their traditional beliefs. Rituals oaths cannot have a criminal purpose and it must be clear the statement of the consequences for breaking the oath. Besides, people who take the oath have to be mature and be aware of the importance of the oath. So ritual oaths cannot be considered in any way as an consent to the situation of sexual exploitation. So let's go now with the third part of this conference, how to work with victims of Nigerian sex trafficking networks. To protect victims and fight against sex trafficking in a more effective way, it's really important to understand the role of African traditional beliefs in Nigerian sex trafficking networks. But it's important to keep in mind at least two things. The first one is that um, we, we should not see the Nigerian sex trafficking just as a abuse of her belief. The vulnerability of the victims, the violence that they encounter, and the psychological trauma they suffer are factors to be taken into account while working with Nigerian sex trafficking victims. Second, culture has to be taken into a consideration, but with balance. That means not interpreting everything as a cultural problem and especially in issues related to do, so that everything that is not understood is explained as a consequence of the belief in the good. Many strategies have been or are being developed by specialists in order to support victims and help them to begin their lives away from sex trafficking. Experts agree that spirituality and religion are key in the life of Nigerian victims. However, they don't agree in the role that this spirituality and religion have to play in the recovery of the victim. Religion which bring calm and security to victims as are elements based on the same level of dimension as the ritual oaths. However, as we said, it's not clear how to work on that. And that is even more difficult for organizations and NGOs that are not linked to religious organizations. So even if the mission, mandate and vision of every organization have to be respected, 
victims need a space where they can talk about their spiritual fears as the recovery for the experience of being sexually exploited is also a spiritual journey. The intervention of cultural mediator is also a key factor. They meet to understand victim easily and calm some situations down. Cultural mediators need to be really important for children and especially if they are much older. Also, the presence of former sex trafficking victims is a successful factor in these cases. Indeed, it's one of the most effective tools to build a stronger links with sex trafficking victims. So, all these strategies are just tactics to get closer to victims and create a climate of confidence where victims can overcome their fears and traumas. Ongoing psychological and psychosocial work with the victim is necessary in order for her to recover her self-esteem, empower her, and help break down the barriers that, care, that keep her away from normalizing her life. So, to come to an end, Nigerian sex trafficking networks are taking profit of victims' belief and are consciously and in a very structured way abusing of elements of African traditional beliefs to sexually slave girls and women. This particular way of coercion has to be considered while fighting against these criminal gangs, as well, in the, as, well as in the process of recovery of victims. As I stated at the beginning, when we first hear about voodoo issues relating with sex trafficking, we may find it incredible, irrational, and even funny somehow. But, as we have seen, the abuse of African traditional religion to enslave girls and women is a reality in Nigerian sex trafficking networks. And each girl, victim of these criminal gangs, deserves that we take this mean of coercion seriously so that they can recover their physical, sexual and spiritual freedom. Thank you very much.